Greetings from Canberra to everyone joining us today. A warm welcome to you all. Uh, I hope you're all keeping safe and healthy during these strange and challenging times. Uh, please let me begin today by acknowledging the Ngunnawal people who are the traditional owners of the land and airways that we are broadcasting to you today from. And I pay my respects to their, their elders, past and present. Okay, let me just briefly introduce our speaker for today. So Professor Andy Hogg. Um, Andy is currently a professor in the ANU Research School of Earth Sciences. Uh, his research interests center on physical processes governing the ocean and climate. He's also a chief investigator of the Australian Research Council Center of Excellence for Climate Extremes, uh, where he leads development of tools to understand the climate system at progressively finer scales. Um, and he has made many unique contributions towards our understanding of the Southern Ocean and is the recipient of multiple prestigious awards, some of which include the Frederick White Prize from the Australian Academy of Science, the Nicholas P. Fofanoff Award from the American Meteorological Society, and the Priestley Medal from the Australian Meteorological and Oceanographic Society. So without further ado, I'll now hand over to Professor Andy Hogg to tell us more about modeling the global ocean circulation. Over to you, Andy. Okay, thank you, Jay. And thank you everyone for attending online. Uh, I'm just going to start up my screen here and confirm with Jay that, uh, well, I'll ask Jay to tell me if there's a problem. Hopefully you can see the image that's on the screen there. Works today I'm going to talk, it's all good? Okay, thank you. Uh, today I'm going to talk about the techniques we use to model the global ocean circulation. And I know there's going to be a range of backgrounds here. Some of you are probably physicists or mathematicians. Some of you might be earth scientists. What, I'm going to, what I'd really like to do is explain the background of what, why and how we want to model the ocean circulation, some of the tools we use to do it, and some of the applications uh, of these models. So to start with, I'm, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the ocean. And this is a, a, a video one of my students made recently when he uh, submitted a paper. And everything you're seeing here uh, well, actually, those little satellites buzzing over there animated, but uh, all the colours you're seeing on the surface of the ocean, that's actually an exaggeration of the surface height uh, of the ocean as recorded by satellites. So these uh, satellite images give us really detailed look at what the, the uh, sea surface height is doing. And, and this little graphic here is just to explain how these altimeters measure the height of the ocean. When you look at these sorts of images, you see that the ocean is actually a very dynamic thing. There's lots and lots of uh, circulation features that are going on at small scales. Some parts of the ocean are, are highly energetic. Uh, some of them are not particularly energetic. You can see that uh, it looks very different when you get close to the equator. And all these things are explainable in terms of, uh, in terms of the, uh, the fundamental physics of how uh, fluid mechanics uh, on the ocean circulation works. So uh, just to pick out a few of the key features here, you can see things, uh, hopefully you can see my mouse here, you can see things like the Gulf Stream coming up the west coast of uh, the eastern coast of the US uh, and the Agalis current that um, you can see uh, off the tip of uh, South Africa here. Uh, and you can also see uh, at the equator a, a few features um, propagating westward, uh, causing lots of big eddies and things like that. So I'm going to stop this simulation here. And uh, if I can get the right uh, button, that's right. And I'm going to ask you all a fundamental question. And Jay is going to actually release a poll, I understand. We can see how that, that works. I, I would like you all to give this a little bit of thought and answer me the question is, why does the ocean circulate? What, what is it that is driving uh, the ocean to actually move in the first place? Because if we know what makes the ocean move, then we've got some ability to understand uh, how things are gonna, um, how things are gonna change and how we can model it. And Jay, maybe you're um, compiling these uh, poll answers and you're going to be able to give them to me at some stage. But um, yeah, uh, while you're answering that, I am going to just press on a little bit and we'll look at your results in a couple of slides. So fundamentally, 
the reason we have a climate system at all is really because in the equatorial regions, we get more sunlight than we lose in, in radiant energy through the top of the atmosphere. So we're always heating uh, the equatorial regions more than we're cooling it by release of energy back to space. On the other hand, in the polar regions, uh, we're actually cooling to space more than we're receiving from sunlight. And this is going on all the time. Of course, these lines uh, oscillate a little around a little bit as we go between uh, seasons. Um, but in general, north of about 38 north, we, we got a net heat loss. And in this equatorial region, we have a net heat gain. And what that means is really to conserve heat, then we must have some sort of system of transporting heat from the equatorial regions to the poles. This is what we call the polewood heat transport. And this graph on the right is showing an estimate of the polewood heat transport that occurs. And the estimate is from this black line here. And that estimate can be broken up into the atmospheric component, which is what you're seeing in the red here, and the ocean component, which is what you're seeing in the blue. So what this is saying is when uh, heat transport is positive, it's pushing heat in a northward direction. And when heat transport is negative, it's pushing heat in a southward direction. And you can see that right at the equator, we're just about at zero. So this is very much uh, the ocean and atmosphere system working to do its best to, um, to shift heat uh, from equator to pole. If it wasn't for that, we wouldn't have a climate system. How does that apply to the ocean? Well, it, implies, it applies to the ocean because we've got a, a very dynamic atmosphere. And so the atmosphere does a few things. Firstly, uh, it, the atmosphere has wind stresses which push on the surface, surface of the ocean and move around uh, the uh, surface ocean waters. And the second thing it does is the atmosphere heats and cools, helps to heat and cool the, um, or provide the boundary conditions that heat and cool the tropical and polar oceans respectively. So at the tropics, the ocean is heating and at the poles, the ocean is cooling. And that is of course linked to the, to the heat transport as well. So if, uh, if Jay maybe has the answer to our poll, because I don't think I can see it, do, are you able to, uh, okay. So um, the question was a little bit of a trick question because the right answer is actually all of the above. Certainly ice formation and melting actually does drive a flow in the ocean. Certainly the winds push the ocean around, but fundamentally the temperature difference between equator and poles also, uh, also help to drive circulation. So in the net, 70% of you, uh, I think picked, um, although these percentages don't quite add up to me, Jay, but that's okay. Um, the majority of you uh, have picked the right answer and hopefully you all thought about the answer for, for just a moment before you, um, before you uh, gave your answer. I think some could pick more than one. Oh, they could be more than that. <laughs> that's, that's, that's why we add up to, to more than 100%. Okay. In fact, maybe maybe you gave one answer and then you reconsidered and, and gave a second, which is just fine. Okay. So uh, we've talked about the fundamentals of what drives our climate system. So the next question, poll question Jay has for you, and again, this isn't, I'm not out to trick you here. What, what I really want to do is uh, is to ask you, what is a model? And um, I'm not gonna leave this one open for very long. So, uh, and, and I guess I'd make the point, some of you, you may be familiar with economic models. Uh, you may be uh, familiar with uh, scale models of, uh, of boats or um, things like that. So um, of course, a, a model, the word model can mean different things to different fields, but um, I'm interested to see uh, what you all think what, of an ocean model. So hopefully you've all got some sort of response in and Jay can maybe show me the answers to this one already. And uh, um, there's a lot of support for empirical fits to observations and projection of trends. Uh, there's a little bit of support for small but exact copy. 
Uh, and there's also a little bit of support for a set of partial differential equations uh, that are solved computationally. So the winner is actually that a model is a set of equations that we use to integrate forward. And so this differs from other fields. It differs from example, from economics and economic modeling, because in economic modeling, you never have a set of physical laws that you can fall back on. What we have for an ocean model is a set of physical laws that we know if we could actually solve the set of equations that I'm writing on the board in front of you here, we could actually model the whole earth system almost exactly. So uh, for those of you who are not mathematicians, don't be scared by this set of equations. I, I, I don't expect you to assimilate everything that's on here, but I do just want to explain just quickly how the, um, how these equations are related to physical laws that you might understand. So this top equation here, well actually this top equation here is a vector equation, so it's actually three equations. And those of you who are doing engineering or heat transfer may recognize this as the Navier-Stokes equation. And this equation is basically a force balance equation. It, it tells us how fast the momentum of, of a fluid will change. And there's a few things coming into play here. There's a term at the end here, which is a viscosity, which damps away uh, things that are happening. There's a pressure gradient term here, which helps to drive a flow. Uh, there's a gravitational term because it turns out the, uh, the, the gravitational forces are important to the, to the ocean. Uh, there's a Coriolis term that you can see here. This is the effect of the rotating earth and it's why flows look different at the equator than they do at the poles. And we've got an advection term here. Uh, this is the tricky term. This is the term that means that we actually find it very difficult to solve this a set of equations for, for a global flow. And this is the term that's really responsible for all those small scale features that you were, you were seeing in that initial animation that I showed. This is a really difficult equation to solve numerically. Um, so I'll, I'll speak a little bit about how we do that in a moment, but, um, but rest assured, if we could solve this, we would have almost the perfect model for the ocean circulation. There's a couple of other things that are important. This is essentially an equation, which is, if you like, the conservation of mass for an incompressible fluid. And this is uh, an equation for uh, the conservation of density. Um, quite often in the ocean, I would break that in, in, up into the conservation of salinity and temperature. Now, if you don't like looking equation, at equations, that's okay, because I'm not going to show you any more equations. Most of the rest I'm going to show you are techniques about how we solve for these equations and, um, and what, we do, what we do with them uh, once we can solve for these equations. So let's move on to think about how we can solve these. So as I said, this is a set of partial differential equations. That means this, these equations are full of derivatives, uh, for example, this triangle here is the gradient, this is the gradient of pressure in three dimensions. So it's dp dx and dp dy. So to solve this, what we actually do is we break the earth up into a bunch of little cubes. Uh, and these, these little cubes allow us to approximate all of these derivatives. We can take the difference between the pressure at one cube and the next, and that will give us this uh, pressure gradient that you're seeing here. So we take the earth, uh, we divide it up into a set of cubes. We'll, we'll divide it up into X and Y um, or latitude and longitude grid like this, if you like. Uh, we'll also divide it up into a series of layers or, or vertical levels. And when we do that, we're in a position that we might be able to begin to discretize these equations, uh, compute little gradients at each location. Once we discretize these equations in space as well as time actually, um, what we will actually do is we can then feed it to a computer and this computer will be able to compute these things for us. So this discretization uh, that you're seeing here, it's not a trivial thing. And uh, in fact, what you're looking at here is a, is a grid that's about one degree by one degree. That's, that's quite a coarse grid. If you can see the, the model of the globe that's sitting in the uh, image right behind me, that's a, 
that's a 0.1 degree grid um, of a model that I'm running here at the moment. And it's a much finer grid. Uh, I'll, I'll speak a little bit more about that. Once you get up to these really high resolution models, you, uh, you need a big computer. Uh, well, first you need a code and then you need a big computer. So uh, a lot of the time we're using um, languages like uh, Fortran or Python that we'll use to model uh, the flow in the ocean. I just, I don't expect you to understand what this particular little tiny bit of code does, but in, a, in an ocean model, we'd have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of lines of this type of code. Uh, and all this code would be to solve those uh, equations once we've discretized them onto a regular grid, which allows us to, um, to solve for those equations. And the final thing we need is a really big computer. Uh, so here's a big computer at the National Computational Infrastructure. And the National Computational Infrastructure sits here at ANU. In fact, if I peer out my window, I can actually see the steam coming off the cooling towers that uh, sit at the NCI. This is their machine, Guardi. There's uh, hundreds of thousands of cores in this machine. Uh, and, and this is the machine where we're running um, uh, all these calculations. And so an ocean model is really, uh, you know, it's a set of equations. That set of equations is, is uh, chopped up into little bits so that we can estimate uh, derivatives. Those derivatives are coded up into a Fortran code or some other coding language, compiled and put on a computer like this, and then, and then the output comes out and we see how things go. So just a, just a point I want to make before I go any further, I'm going to jump back to this slide here where I'm talking about the discretization. And here there's, we've always got a, a trade-off. So in, uh, in this particular grid, it's about a one degree by one degree. And that means we have around about 360 by 180 points in the horizontal, plus maybe 50 layers in the vertical. And we want to integrate that whole system forward in time for 10 years, 100 years, whatever we like. So um, every time we compute something on one of these grids, we have to ask the computer to compute a quantity. So obviously, uh, if we have less grids, then we have to make you know, uh, less computations. And so if we space all these grids out, then we have to make less computations and actually our model runs much faster. But if we space these grids out, then we can't resolve all the processes that are going on. And so if we want to um, resolve all the processes that are going on, we need a really fine grid. And in fact, the processes in the global ocean vary between the millimeter scales of, uh, of convective turbulence and the basin wide 100 kilometer scales that, excuse me, that, that you're seeing um, as we go across the uh, the whole globe. And so uh, what we have here is we have a, a compromise between the number of grid points we use and the number of grid points we can afford. So the more we can afford, the more processes we can resolve, the better will be the physics of our model. But the computational cost of that is, is, is it can get immense. Okay, so I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to show you a few examples of, um, of how we use ocean models. And a lot of these examples come from a model that I helped to build here at ANU. It's called Access RM2. Um, uh, what I'm showing you here is the 10th degree uh, uh, climate model. Uh, this is a little animation. I hope it doesn't make you too dizzy. Um, it's a little choppy on my machine. It's probably a bit choppy on yours as well. And uh, what I'm showing here for those of you who have studied the ocean is the relative vorticity. That is the curl of the velocity at a particular level. I'm taking, I'm taking 30 meters. Out on the right here, you can see a, a timeline uh, moving ahead. And the point is that these, uh, this relative vorticity is a good tracer to really understand the dynamics of of what's going on. So you can see in the tropical Pacific, we get all these large scale eddies as we go past the top of Australia through the Indonesian archipelago. Uh, we see lots of boundary current interactions. We see this comb like uh, 
effects and eddies that are happening in the Arabian Sea. Um, and so you can see that this uh, simulation is picking out a lot of the dynamic features. This is the Gulf Stream ripping up the, the coast of uh, America. In a moment, we're going to see hopefully the Kurashio, which is on the other side of the Pacific, or maybe we'll drift too far north before we see it. No, here's the Kurashio off the current off the coast of Japan. And to get a simulation like this, what I need to do is I need to um, is I need to run the model for uh, on something like 5,000 cores on our computer here. Actually, the model scales to something like 20,000 cores, but I can't get that through the queue because we don't have a we don't have enough computer time. Um, and um, roughly speaking, I spend about 50,000 compute hours per year of simulation. Often, I want to run this model for 10 years, 100 years. Uh, our longest run has gone for 300 years, uh, and so um, and uh, and so on. So, so this is the Access IM2 model, and I'm going to show you a few of the types of research questions we can answer with that. As I'm going through these, I, I just want to encourage you, if you have a question, you can uh, ask the question on the Q&A. Um, I'm, um, I'm going to get to those questions most likely at the end, um, and I'll I probably won't interrupt my talk, um, and but I'll, um, I'll. In fact, I can see that there's a question here which I actually want to answer right now, which which may help some of you. So I'll do that now. And that is, someone asked why we use relative vorticity instead of relative velocity. What is its significance? And the vorticity is, you know, it's actually derived from the velocity itself. The reason I'd like to show vorticity sometimes is because it really brings out these eddying structures. So you can see these circular eddying structures. And that's just brought out a little bit more in the relative vorticity. You can also see them in velocity. So this is really, I would call this simulation eye candy. This is just something that I want to um, that I want to show um, uh, just, just to show what these patterns look like in the ocean. Um, and really, to, to, just to emphasize just how dynamic uh, the ocean is. So um, I'll come to some of the other questions uh, later, but first I want to elaborate a little bit on some of our, um, some of the bigger projects we're doing here at ANU. Um, and this might help to answer some of your questions that I can see coming through. So I'm going to show you now an animation of, from this model that's going to focus on the Southern Ocean. And the Southern Ocean is a, is a big uh, topic of research for our group. And one of the reasons is because we're very interested in what's going on close to Antarctica, where you can see sea ice forming and the ocean sitting up right against the, uh, the continent here, where there's ice shelves that are beginning to rapidly melt. And uh, this is actually showing the, the velocity at the surface here. But what I actually want to do with this simulation is, is to peel back what's going on at the surface and look at what's going on at the bottom of the ocean. So what you can see here is that we're taking a, a what I call an isopycnal layer. This is a layer of constant density. And I'm looking at velocity or speed on this, on this uh, surface. And you can see that there's really dense water up on the shelf here, the, the Antarctic continental shelf really close to the continent. And that water cascades off the shelf, a bit like a massive underwater waterfall, and then fills up the basin at the bottom of the ocean. And this dense water just sort of sits there. As we peel back and look around at the Ross Sea, I'm going to look at another uh, surface here. This is another part of Antarctica. Again, this part of Antarctica is also associated with really cold, dense water forming up on the shelf here. And you can see these uh, waterfalls flowing off the, uh, these dense waterfalls flowing down, getting down to what I call the abyssal ocean, and then flowing around and, and uh, doing a lot, of, um, a lot of dynamic interaction with the topography and the bathymetry uh, in those lower regions. So this is a process that we call, uh, uh, a process that calls, uh, causes uh, the formation of abyssal water. It's a type of water that we oceanographers refer to as Antarctic bottom water. And 
Um, the uh, Antarctic bottom water kind of fills up the very bottom of the ocean and sits there for a very long time. In parts of the Pacific Ocean, water can, can be at the abyssal part of the ocean for thousands of years before it gets back up to the surface. And when we look at, um, uh, uh, this, is, this is now looking at more in the middle of the Southern Ocean and it, it's showing how much, uh, how dynamic the uh, intermediate depth field is with all these little features that we call ocean eddies that are always uh, moving around. And so the, the ambition of this, uh, of this uh, animation is just to give you an idea of what the, um, just how dynamic these features are, particularly these eddies that you can see off the uh, coast of Africa here. Um, but also to give you a feel for how close to Antarctica this uh, bottom water can be formed. This bottom water is really dense and cold and it sinks right to the bottom and stays there for a very long time. Okay, um, so I'm going to jump forward to, to understanding one of the projects that, that uh, is key to our work here and that is to use this model uh, to understand how things may change in the future. So many of you may have heard that the ice shelves around Antarctica, that's uh, fringing around Antarctica here, that the ice shelves uh, are causing a lot of meltwater and this meltwater puts fresh, really low salinity water into the surface regions of, uh, uh, of the coastal Antarctic Ocean. And this coastal Antarctic Ocean water is really important because as, as you just saw in the, in the recent movie I showed, this coastal Antarctic region forms really dense water, which follows these pathways uh, down into the, into the abyssal ocean. Uh, and one of the things we want to know is, well, if melting of Antarctic oceans is, uh, of, uh, of Antarctic ice shelves is going to continue, how is that going to affect uh, the, the bottom of the ocean? Excuse me while I turn my lights on. How is that going to affect the bottom of the ocean? And so one of our students a couple of years ago worked on this uh, question and what she did is she took this uh, model and instead of trying to replicate reality, she used a scenario to jump forward to the year 2100 and to dump in the amount of fresh water that we expect to be melting off glaciers by 2100. And when she did this, she found that uh, uh, we went from a, um, a state of the oceans around Antarctica where we would um, put in a lot of this fresh water and this fresh water would cool part of the Antarctic shelf here and it would warm other parts of the Antarctic shelf. And so different parts of the Antarctic shelf responded differently and we can only get this signal when we, uh, when we have a model that is at fine enough resolution uh, to really represent all the processes that are going on here. So the idea here is to, is, and this is a little bit in reference to one of the questions which I'll come to later, is, is to avoid using sub-grid scale uh, models for things. It's actually, it's actually here to, to simulate as many of the important processes that, he, that we think we can. Okay, uh, I'm going to move away from the Southern Ocean for a moment and I'm going to talk about something else which uh, which is important to the ocean, in fact, to the climate, uh, which is El Nino. And, uh, and many of you will, heard of El, uh, will have heard of El Nino before, but you may not really understand uh, a lot about the dynamics of, of what's happening with El Nino. So I just want to show you this animation, which is again, something we made from our ocean model. And this is simulating a, an El Nino event, which occurred in uh, 1997, 98. And we've got a little El Nino meter down on the right here. And to help show what's going on here, we're going to pull out a little bit of water from the, uh, along the equatorial Pacific. And you can see that in the normal course of events, the Western Pacific is really warm and the Eastern Pacific is less warm. And when we come into an El Nino, this warm water from the West Pacific floods back across the Pacific. And you can see that um, the El Nino, uh, um, uh, causes this warm water to, to be in the East Pacific. When we come back to a La Nina, the opposite happens. And you can see now the, the warm water really piling up in the Western 
part of the ocean. You're going to see that again now, but you're going to see that again uh, in anomaly space. So we're now looking at the temperature anomalies and you can see that uh, you will see in a moment that as we launch into 1997, when the El Nino started, all this warm water floods across to the east. This causes huge amounts of rainfall and flooding in, in the Eastern Pacific. But for those of us in the Western Pacific, like Australia and Indonesia, uh, we experience dry conditions because the ocean is so cold, the tropical ocean is so cold, there's less evaporation, less moisture in the atmosphere. Uh, on the other hand, when we, when we come to uh, La Nina conditions, uh, this ocean returns to being, uh, in, in the Western Pacific, returns to being warm and uh, we, we recover um, uh, the normal climate, the normal wetter climate that we experience in the Western Pacific. So we jump, jump now to a different uh, frame, which is, this is a little bit of an attempt to show how these things are happening in three dimensions. So we're now plotting the temperature anomalies uh, as a volume. And again, we move into 1997 and you can see these uh, warm anomaly is flooding all the way across. So this is a huge amount of warm water which floods across to the Eastern Pacific and, um, and then floods back once the El Nino ends in mid-1998 and turns back into a, a, a La Nina. So ocean models, particularly higher resolution ocean models that can resolve all these processes uh, are very useful. Uh, for understanding how these events develop and for understanding the sensitivity of these events to future change. And one of the big questions that the climate uh, center that I'm a part of uh, is trying to answer is, you know, how do these El Nino events cause extreme climate conditions and how are these El Nino events going to respond uh, to extreme climate conditions uh, in the future? So, um, uh, I'm going to jump to my uh, final example here. And again, I'm going to show this example uh, by way of an animation. And this is an animation we made when we released a paper on this topic. And um, it was actually, this is actually quite an interdisciplinary project. And it was uh, motivated by a, a um, biologist friend of mine who discovered um, I'm just going to stop this one for a moment, if I can. Yes, I can. Uh, and my um, collaborator discovered, uh, they discovered that on the beaches of West Antarctica, just here, that um, some kelp had been washed up on this beach. And this kelp is um, the Villia kelp, which grows on sub-Antarctic islands. So only grows around islands that are around 60 degrees of latitude. And the common wisdom amongst the biologists is this kelp could not make it south of 60 degrees south. The, the physical system would stop them. And this was, this was almost folklore in the biology community. And um, yet she discovered that some of this kelp had been washed up. It hadn't come by boat. It must have floated on the surface of the ocean. How could it possibly get there? And, and so she turned to us to, to, to answer this question. And the answer, the physical answer to this was actually, uh, that it's a combination of these small scale eddies that you can see rushing around here and the, um, the poleward migration of, of uh, some of these parcels during storm events. So what you're seeing here is the trajectories of a whole lot of kelp that we seeded our model with. So we put some kelp into our model and then we decided to see uh, where they went. And the, and the fact is most of them follow this blue trajectory trajectory and end up going to the north and they end up in the um, subtropical ocean. But these little orange ones down here, they didn't go to the north. They were driven south by a storm or a particular eddy event. And this was the first time you could, you could actually show that um, some of these kelp uh, could actually get to the beaches on West Antarctica uh, via the pathway that we were, that we were talking about. So I'm just going to, um, I'm just going to play that one again because there are a few things uh, there that I that I didn't get to. So all the kelp in this particular animation are released from South Georgia, um, and you'll notice that of of these 140 selected kelps, 
Only one of them came through Drake Passage here. Most of the rest went north and about 10 of it made it, made it to Antarctica. And uh, so what you can see is that initially these kelp all start out together and they very slowly diverge. A lot of their motion is coherent, but sometimes they diverge and you can see particularly some of them just get swept up in individual currents, but they're, they're still blue in, mixed in with orange here. Some of them made the beach quite early. They got stuck in, uh, stuck in a, uh, the Antarctic slope current and pulled around the other way. And some of them made it all the way around uh, uh, to the West Antarctic Peninsula. So, um, so this, this was a very interesting project to be involved in because it was, it was fundamentally interdisciplinary. We, we needed the high resolution modeling tools, but we also needed the uh, genetic sequencing of kelp to discover where the kelp had come from. Uh, and it's the sort of project we, we, uh, we like to get involved in. So I'm going to sum up there and that'll allow plenty of time for questions, but I, I just want to emphasize that ocean modeling is something that I, I really enjoy. I, I enjoy the fluid mechanics part of it. I really enjoy the maths and the computational science part of it. But um, I also enjoy uh, the applications that we get out of ocean modeling from, from biology through to ecology, through to climate. Uh, it means that we can use fundamental physics and fundamental computer science and maths to understand problems that are really important to the real world. And that's one of the reasons why I um, continue to, to work in this area. Through my career, I've seen, I've seen models go from uh, what I would call to be, you know, rudimentary models through to these eddy resolving models that I'm showing on the left here. And uh, when I started in this field, basically we couldn't, we couldn't simulate uh, the ocean system at this scale with these sorts of eddies. So it's been interesting to see how things develop and models are becoming more and more sophisticated and more and more able uh, to resolve a huge range of scales. Um, which is which I look forward to seeing how that continues to develop. So I think I'm going to stop there and uh, I'd encourage you to keep asking questions on the chat and I'm going to get through them one by one unless Jay wants to jump in and suggest uh, suggest a way to proceed. Uh, please go ahead, Andy. One by one is fine. Okay, let's do that. So, um, I think what happens uh, is when I click a question that I'd like to answer um, the uh, question should come up for you is that correct Jay people should be seeing this question here yes that's correct okay so this question is why is the southern ITCZ that is the intertropical convergence zone which is like the meteorological equator why is the southern weaker than the northern uh, in terms of ocean atmosphere interaction um, and emphasizes the double ITZ TZZ features uh, that occur in the Pacific and Atlantic. And so in general, there's, a, there's been a lot of work recently on, on how when you have one hemisphere which is warmer than the other, that can pull the ITCZ uh, one way or the other. And so it turns out that um, the ITCZ, which, uh, um, which is roughly at the equator, is is further north at the moment than uh, than um, than it is to the south, and so that that is effectively because the northern hemisphere is warmer, and that is effectively because, if you like, there's more land in the northern hemisphere than there there is in the ocean, which uh, helps to cool things off. Um, feel free to post a follow up if um, uh, if you if you need. So I've been asked, uh, please elaborate on the characteristics of these patterns in the ocean. And this question came up when I was showing um, my original uh, potential vorti uh, relative vorticity movie. So um, I'm going to go back to that and people can watch that while I'm answering this question. Wow, there is so many uh, characteristic patterns going on here. Close to Antarctica, you can see really small scale features beneath the seasonal sea ice and the formation of this Antarctic slope current, which comes around here. This west to east current in the middle is, of the Southern Ocean is called the Antarctic Circumpolar Current, which is a sort of wind and buoyancy and topography driven current. Um, 
This is a western boundary current, which is uh, which is part of the subtropical gyre system in the in the southern Indian Ocean. And often you'll see these western boundary currents going poleward along the western boundary of an ocean basin. Um, and you've got a lot of uh, east-west currents right at the equator causing tropical instability waves. There's just a huge number of processes going on here and I can elaborate a little bit on them, but um, I, I can't elaborate uh, too much. So the next question I'm going to look at is what subgrid scale model do you use, if any? And the answer to that is, yes, we use heaps of subgrid scale models. And um, for those of you who are doing engineering, you're probably used to terms like direct numerical simulation uh, and large eddy simulation or Reynolds, Reynolds average Navier-Stokes. And, um, you know, I would love to be able to use direct numerical simulation um, to simulate all these. Uh, some of my one of my collaborators down at Uni of Melbourne, Bishad Guyan, he, he uh, is an expert in this, this type of thing. Uh, and direct numerical simulation simulates all the scales that you can, but you can't possibly do that over the entire ocean. So you need all sorts of subgrid scale models. The types of ones we use include sub -MESA scale parameterizations. Sometimes we use a, a MESA scale eddy parameterization. Uh, we use different, um, subgrid scale models for uh, convection. These convective models are, are very poor, um, but they're things that we're trying to improve. Um, we use subgrid scale models to understand how energy and momentum comes from the atmosphere into the ocean, how gases are exchanged across the ocean atmosphere into interface. And so I'd say in one of these ocean models, you're normally implementing something like 10 subgrid scale models to deal with a whole lot of processes that you just can't resolve. Um, what, have I, what else have I got here? Uh, let's answer this one. How do atmosphere and climate models compare to ocean models? Uh, that question was clarified, so I'll, I'll put both of them up. Please give an overview comment. So um, atmosphere models, uh, and ocean models really have um, the same fundamental underpinnings in that they really depend on fluid mechanics. The big differences are in the ocean, we have to track salinity and temperature. The flow of the ocean occurs on very small scales and takes a long time to adjust. The ocean is, the atmosphere, sorry, is much more compressible. Uh, instead of salinity and temperature, we're interested in temperature and moisture. Uh, we really care about microscale physics in clouds um, and we have uh, atmospheric currents are much larger scale, winds are much larger scale, but they establish themselves much more quickly. So, um, you know, it's, it's the same sort of principle. I can go to an atmospheric modeler and we can talk the same language. What I can't do is turn around and use my model for the ocean exactly to, to model the atmosphere. In a climate model, well, in a climate model, you actually need everything. You need the ocean, you need the atmosphere, you need the sea ice, uh, you need uh, the land surface scheme. So a climate model is much more complicated and a big part of a climate model is actually integrating all these different models uh, together to, to produce a, a coherent simulation. Okay, um, let me uh, answer this one, uh, which is about whether an ocean model can be used to simulate real-time events such as tropical cyclones. And the answer is yes. And uh, well, we can't, we can't simulate the atmospheric component of a tropical cyclone, but we can simulate the ocean component. And so the way we would do that is, um, is we would use, a combination of a model like this, and we would use it in combination with a technique called data assimilation. And data assimilation is basically a fancy word for getting the initial condition of an ocean, um, uh, initial condition of the ocean, so an initial state, if you like. And that means that we can use all the satellites and observations that are available to initialize the model to a state which is very close to today. And then you can move forward and, and predict uh, near term 
uh, events. And that's what numerical weather prediction does. And that's what I would call ocean state forecasting. And ocean state forecasting in Australia is done by the Bureau of Meteorology. In your country, it's probably done by, by a bureau uh, as well, uh, some sort of meteorological uh, bureau. And uh, the, the development of this access OM2 model is really to get the next generation uh, ocean forecasting model. Ocean forecasting is an operational forecasting, which means that when they run the model, it has to work. Uh, when I run the model, I like to play games with it and find out interesting things. So uh, the way we do this is I've, I've, my, me and my group have been working on this model for the last few years. And in the future, the um, operational agencies are picking up this model. In fact, they're already doing it. And maybe by next year, they'll be using this model for their operational forecasts. And um, they'll, they'll use that for another four or five years. By which stage the researchers will have moved on to another model. In fact, we're already moving on to another model um, uh, to use. So, so thank you for that question. Um, so let's answer another question. What do you think will be the global temperature mean sea level and speed of currents on average after let's say 15 to 20 years? Very good question. Um, global temperature will be a degree higher. Uh, maybe only 0.6 of a degree, but I think it'll go up. Sea level will go up. That's, uh, generally sea level will go up everywhere, but um, it'll go up faster in some places than others. Um, I hate to say it, but the, the Western Pacific region is probably gonna cop a lot of the sea level rise and it's probably least equipped to deal with it. And so that's, a, you know, it's a big concern to many of us living in this region. Um, there's a big uncertainty as to how big that sea level rise will be. And we're working to reduce that uncertainty by better understanding um, things like uh, what's going on around the fringes of Antarctica and what the Antarctic contribution will be to global sea level rise. Uh, speed of currents on average, they will, they will change a little bit, but uh, that's much more difficult to predict than than the sea level or global temperature. A uh, very good question here. How do we validate this ocean model with empirical data from the actual, from the actual oceans? And, uh, and that's a really good point. So one way we do that is actually through this data assimilation process that I was talking about before. And we've recently been through this exercise with our model and the data assimilation people picked up that, well, look, you, you, in our model, we're developing big subsurface biases in the ocean in the tropical Pacific. And these were biases that we hadn't expected to see. And they revealed a problem with our model that we can now go away and fix. And we've now identified the problem and we're in the process of um, improving that aspect of our simulation. And so that's, that's a key, uh, key thing. Uh, we do have some standard metrics that we use um, uh, and I'll refer you to a paper on, you know, when we released the model, we actually, re there's about 20 or 30 figures comparing the model output with, uh, with, with the best that we can observe. So good question. Um, missed the part where I, you explained about vorticity. Don't apologize for that. You did, I, uh, sorry, I'll put this up. Uh, you did miss the part where I explained about vorticity because I didn't really explain it very well. So truth be told, vorticity is the curl of the velocity. And um, we care about that in the ocean because if you go through about 10 pages of maths, you can demonstrate that under some situations, vorticity is a nicely conserved quantity, but it's a mathematically abstract. Um, so I decided that in a talk that was so short, I probably couldn't, um, I couldn't do it justice. Uh, but um, if, you, if you are more interested in this, you can look up something called uh, Ertel's potential vorticity, and you'll find some, some really interesting mathematics behind how, how um, vorticity works. Uh, can we get live data to model real-time systems? Um, that is a question which I think I've already answered thanks to uh, data assimilation and ocean state forecasting. 
Um, and this is a question which uh, is again about the validation against empirical data. And um, uh, it's actually more specific than the last question. It wants to uh, ask the specific parameters we can measure. So we can, we can measure sea surface height really well from satellite. And um, therefore we can measure the variability of sea surface height. And so that gives us an idea of how dynamic the ocean is. And that's one of the key things we validated this, uh, this model against and found it comes, comes up fairly well. Um, we can model the mean flow in the current systems less well. We can model the sea surface temperature quite well. We can observe the sea surface temperature quite well, but only at the very, very, very surface. So that's very hard to validate against. And there's a lot of robots out in the ocean and, and ship cruisers that are looking at salinity and temperature distribution within the ocean. And those salinity, you know, salinity and temperature is moved around by these ocean currents. And so that's also something that we, that we look at a lot. Okay. Um, let me see, a couple of these are comments. Um, Here's one from left field. Can we use the modeling to understand the Bermuda Triangle fluid mechanics? And is there scientific explanation? Uh, not that I'm aware of. There's, there is nothing particular there that is going on in the ocean. Uh, you are welcome. All the data I've, I use for my model is actually available publicly on the um, thread server at NCI here. And so you could actually download a ocean model of the Bermuda Triangle area and, and have a look yourself. Pretty sure there's nothing going on there. Um, how am I going, Jay? Oh, why don't I take this one, which I haven't read yet, but I'll read it as we go. Will global ocean level rise as a result of melting glaciers affect all these simulations? If yes, will it be a difficult task to include the melting glaciers as an additional factor? Uh, modeling these changes is different. Um, uh, and is this difficulty in modeling the reason why polity makers are procrastinating to take any concrete actions given the adverse effects of global warming? Very good question. Um, my, my personal view is that, um, so, so let's deal with this in order. Global ocean level rise will, will occur as a result of melting glaciers. And that's an important uh, uncertainty that we really want to get to grips with. So we're going to be working on that a lot. Global sea level rise also occurs just because the ocean's warming, because warmer water takes slightly more volume. And so, so far, most of the sea level rise that we've experienced has been more through warming than it has been through melting glaciers. So that's an important point. It's very easy to model the thermal expansion of seawater, and it's very easy to understand how sea level will rise in response to, um, to global warming. This has been obvious for a long time and it is not the reason why policymakers are procrastinating. Um, the, uh, the additional um, warming, uh, sea level rise from melting glaciers is more difficult to model, but I, again, I don't think that's the excuse for procrastination. The excuse for procrastination is really just um, uh, that it's, it's difficult to get people to change uh, the way they do things. And um, I'm, I, I think, you know, there's a lot of vested interests in, in uh, various uh, systems. I think we're seeing change. We're seeing change in many countries at the moment. We're seeing uh, the adoption of renewable energy in large scale electric vehicles where we're seeing and i think you'll find that once these energy systems change they'll change really quickly and i have actually have a lot of hope for for how this sector is going to cope with this in the future um so one last question if i've got time jay um and that is how much do the small scale dynamics affect the large scale circulation? And the answer is that depends on which region you're in. Um, in the Southern Ocean, we've been making a case for some time that these small scale eddies that you can see here affect the large scale. 
We also know that small scale mixing and convection have a feedback onto the, the large scale ocean circulation. One of the problems we have is that um, the models that we use to represent these small scales are very expensive. So it's very hard to answer that question in a way, um, in a way that, um, you know, with, with a modeling tool, because modeling both the slow large scale system at the same time as modeling the fast small scale things uh, is very computationally expensive. So it's very difficult to answer those questions with a single model simulation. But there are definitely many examples where the small scales are actually important to the large scales. How are we going, Jay? Are we, are we just about done for the day? Yeah, I mean, maybe five more minutes. And yeah, I've got a question after you're done with this, another one there, I'm happy for you to take that and then, yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll answer this one then. Will warming oceans also contribute to more ocean calamities? Um, I'm not sure what sort of ocean calamities you're thinking about, but, um, you know, I mean, sea level rise is, is a calamity for some people, um, you know, uh, It'll be economically expensive, but but humanitarian, you know, societally in some low-lying areas, it'll be catastrophic. Um, the other catastrophic thing is a combination of ocean warming and acidification can really affect, uh, for example, the formation of coral reefs. These coral reefs are critical for our biodiversity. Uh, and I think it's, you know, almost certain that, um, we will see more, for example, coral reef bleaching uh, episodes. And I'm not a biologist, but I, I you know, I'm not that optimistic uh, about the health of our reefs in the long term with the current uh, ocean warming. Uh, another calamity is sea ice in the Arctic region, which is is very, you know, has taken a big hit um, and. Uh, that as a consequence of disappearance of sea ice in the Arctic region, what we find is that uh, the, uh, the surface of the ocean is less white and more black and it absorbs more radiation and you get a positive feedback effect that the Arctic Ocean is warming faster than, than you know, the Arctic is warming faster than any other part of the planet. And so that's, that's a big concern and it's, uh, you know, the ocean sea ice system is key for that. So uh, short answer, yes, I've given you a few examples. There are other examples around that, that you can look up if you like. Thanks, Andy. And you're being streamed in a few lecture theatres around the world. So a question has come from one of those. Hopefully you can answer it quickly. Um, is the ocean circulation slowing? If yes, why? And what could the impact be on climate change? As a whole, I would say the ocean circulation is not slowing. Um, the, uh, there are possible um, modes of ocean circulation which will slow down. So a lot of what I've shown you in, in plots like, like this one on screen here, what you're seeing is the signature of horizontal circulation and, and near surface currents. But one of the important currents is this uh, overturning circulation, this deep circulation which takes dense water down to the bottom uh, of the ocean. Um, and there are theories that that deep limb of the overturning circulation could slow down, uh, particularly in the North Atlantic region. Um, and the, about 15 years ago, oceanograph oceanographers set out to um, study that overturning circulation more carefully. And what they discovered is it's much more variable than they thought, but uh, that variability does seem to have a slowing effect. Um, and so that is one mode of circulation which might slow down in the future. And so um, if, that, if that did occur, then what you would find is you would find a, a reduction in heat transport in the North Atlantic that would potentially change many things, uh, ecosystems uh, through to societies in, in the Northern Hemisphere. But to be honest, it's a little bit um, too early to know how long such a calamitous change might take. And I'm skeptical that it's going to become a first order problem. So.
Thank you. Um, I don't know if you have time just to take this another one that has come in. No, there is another one that's come in um, about machines that can reduce the impact of cyclones and tsunamis. And the answer is that the power behind these natural forces is too much for us to control with machines. So I don't believe that that is something that we could possibly do. Great. I think that's, we should wrap that up there, Andy. So thank you very much. Okay. Thanks on behalf of all the attendees and of course everyone here um, for giving this talk. Um, I'm sure people can find you on the ANU website um, if they're keen and on getting in touch or looking at your research. Um, they can just Google Andy Hogg and they'll, they'll, they'll find you. Yes, so, you should find me. Yes. Great. Thank you, Andy. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, there are a few similar talks, um, you know, on different areas of sciences that are going to happen for the rest of this month. So, um, yeah, we may see you at some of those. Thank you. Have a good evening, afternoon, morning, day, um, wherever you are. Um, and we'll see you next time. Great. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.